The Iron Flute, Case 90. The Broken Tray. There was once a monk who practiced for 30 years in a little hut called Hitaan, meaning Fertile Fields Hut. Fugai comments, maybe he did not know how to move. He owned just one tray made of clay. Fugai, it's not always the expensive things that are precious. One day, a monk who was practicing under him accidentally broke the tray. Fugai, the real treasure appears through the breaking. Every day, the teacher asked him to replace it. Fugai, why would you want another? But each time the monk brought a new one, the teacher threw it out, saying, this is not it. Give me back my original one. Then we have a series of comments. Fugai, I would open my hands and laugh. Yogen Senzaki, no one knows the name of that monk, but his statement, this is not it. Give me back my original one, is noteworthy. Genro, if I were his student, I would say, wait until the sun rises in the west. Fugai, I will search for it where I have not yet been born. Genro, it is broken. Fugai, the whole tray remains. Genro, run after it. Fugai, the sword disappears in the water. Genro, the student cannot understand it. Fugai, it has already returned to him. Genro, you're calling an iron kettle a bell. Fugai, you can call the earth heaven. What's wrong with that? Middle day of session. We slurped. Wonderful transitional noodles from first half now entering into the next. Next. Such a beautiful, subtle day out there in grays and tans. The sky is calm. Nothing is coming out right now. And the trees are 
almost imperceptibly swaying, nodding. The ice is melting. The rigidity in our hearts is melting. We can't help it. Does anybody want to keep clinging? Keep that rigid form going? Can't help it. Naturally, that wonderful word for Tanka Zenji's name, naturally. This fourth day of session is unfolding. And we're getting back to the iron flute after a year of the 10 ox herding pictures. The ox has gone back into the mist and disappeared. And now we have <laughs> tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. I don't know where that came from, and I certainly can't finish it, but if somebody would like to, feel free. Be more of a hand or eye in a very beautiful symmetry. What immortal hand or eye? Huh? Yeah. Each one of us. You don't have a Band-Aid on your fingers, probably. But this hand and I, who is that? Hmm? Kanzeon. So anyway, the Iron Flute, it's a collection of 100 cases that were <coughs> compiled in 1783 by Genro Oryu. He lived from 1720 to 1813, and he was a Japanese Soto master who collected these hundred koans and wrote verses and comments. And his successor, Fugai Honko, added illustrations and rather irreverent and often penetrating remarks. So here's a picture by Fugai Honko, and several are in the book. In 1939, Yogen Senzaki began translating the collection into English and adding his own commentaries. With the editing help of his disciple, Ruth, Strout McCandless, and they continued working on it even after he was imprisoned at Heart Mountain internment camp during the war. So it was published in 1961, three years after he passed away. And in his introduction, he says, Teteki Tosui is the name of the original text. Teteki means iron flute. Usually a flute is made of bamboo with a mouthpiece and several side holes for the fingers. 
But this flute is a solid iron rod with neither mouthpiece nor finger holes. Tosui means to blow it upside down. So are you ready to do this? Upside down blowing music with through an iron, a solid iron rod. The ordinary musician who wanders among the lines of the grand staff will never be able to handle this Zen instrument. But one who plays the stringless harp can also play this flute with no mouthpiece. So Yogan Senzaki sets us up this way. And today, case 90, we meet a nameless monk and his nameless disciple. What a relief. Can't look him up. Can't tell you a thing about him. And this is important. The stringless harp, the flute with no mouthpiece, no finger holes, no name. We are here getting rid of our names, getting rid of the labels. They'll be waiting for you, have no fear. They're very sticky. And before you know it, you'll walk out of here with a little sticky note on your forehead. Oh, my name is, I'm from, I was born in, what my job is, how and where, and all of this. But not now. And it's a short and simple koan, but Genro and Fugai have a field day with it. And it begins, there was once a monk who practiced for 30 years in a little hut called Fertile Fields. Now, I'm sure you can imagine this simple dwelling with only the barest of necessities represented here by a ceramic tray. The hut itself, we are given to understand, is surrounded by fertile fields, naturally fertilized, no Monsanto, naturally with ample amounts of manure. Fugai says, maybe he did not know how to move. And he's not talking about the nameless monk's bowels here. Imagine yourself spending 30 years, not seven days, in this comfortable building with heat and lights, wonderful food, but 30 years in one spot, one room with one tray, 
such pure-hearted dedication, such one-pointed practice. Admirable, hmm? That fertile field's hut was the epicenter of the universe. Distractions had long fallen away. Yet, Fugai sets up a challenge. Maybe the monk didn't know how to move, how to actualize. Maybe he couldn't function out in the world or down the mountain in the villages. He had his perfect retreat. But was he stuck in his solitude? Was his practice a trifle complacent? Maybe even stale? Some of you no doubt remember Gute, the recluse. Case three of the Mumon Khan, the gateless barrier. Gute is sitting in Zazen in his mountain hut. The nun Jise comes in her pilgrim's attire, wearing her large straw hat. She enters his hut. She walks around Gute three times and demands. Say a word. I'll take off my hat and stay a while. Gute is speechless. Again, she walks three times around his seat. Again, asks. Again, he can't respond. She starts to weep. He says, It's getting dark. Why not stay the night? She says, Say a word and I'll stay. He's at a complete loss. What's she looking for? What word? Don't we all do this? Try to figure out what someone else wants? You know, you go to Dogsama, what does she really want me to say? (laughs) What someone else expects. Instead of responding naturally and directly from our own heart, mind. Oh, what if I get it wrong? What if my heart, mind isn't a good enough heart, mind? Nobody here has to worry about that, but it happens to people. So, you know, if it comes directly from within you, it's never wrong. And it's never right. As soon as you have right and wrong, confusion ensues, and mind is lost. So said. So san zenji. The nun, meanwhile, walks out. And Gute spends a sleepless night filled with self-reproach and decides to leave in search of 
a teacher. But the guardian deity of the mountain, who is the guardian deity of our mountain here? The Daigongen of Daibosatsu Mountain. appears to us and says, stay. How many times have you wanted to leave so far? Stay. A living bodhisattva will soon arrive. This happens if we really stay with it. All the I needs, I don't likes, all of that just <sighs> drops away. And Dai Bosatsu appears. Sure enough, along came Koshu Tenryu with great chagrin. Gute tells him of his inability to respond to the nun's question. How many times have we been in such a situation? Everything's going along just fine, thank you. And then Something unexpected happens. Shakes us out of our complacency. Throws us into the muck and mire of fertile fields. And most importantly, compels us to do some deep reflection and questioning, what am I doing with my life? What is it for? What's keeping me stuck? Why do I keep making the same mistake over and over again? Why can't I access my Buddha nature. So Gute put it this way to Tenryu. He asked him, what is the essence of Buddha's teaching? What am I missing? Tenryu. And at that, Gute awakens. And he says, he uses this one finger Zen all his life, as is vividly presented in case three. So we're talking today about recluses. And of course, I think of my Dharma grandfather, Soen Nakagawa Roshi. He was a natural recluse. But he also loved literature, loved tea ceremony, music, Beethoven especially, Ninth Symphony, no theater, and was considered the best haiku poet 
of his time, the best haiku poet since Basho. His brilliance and profundity were evident even when he was a small boy. But he knew he had to become a monk. Why? He just knew he had to. And at the age of 24, he was ordained on his birthday, March 19th, 1931. Ordained by Keigaku Katsube Roshi of Kogakuji, temple founded by the great Basui Zenji. But very soon after his ordination, he went on solitary retreat and began living in a hut on Daibosatsu Mountain near Mount Fuji. And he named his hut Dainichian. Dainichi is for Vairochana Buddha. And created the Daibosatsu mantra Namu Daibosa. He did this kind of solitary retreat all through those years. So it was really shocking for him and for everyone who knew him when Gempo Roshi made him his successor. And he had to take on the iron yoke of being abbot of Yudhakaji. But back to the koan. This nameless monk owned just one tray made of clay. Fugai comments, it's not always the expensive things that are precious. We might even go a step further and say what? say everything is precious, everything is most holy. Or we might say the expensive things are not precious. Just one ceramic tray, probably very old, made by some unknown village potter, Maybe chipped, cracked, filled with sabi wabi, rustic, irregular, unadorned. The one and only vessel of his life. This is truly what is most precious. When we have an abundance of material things, often we want to acquire more. Oh, this needs that. And that suggests to me that I should have that. And many people feel that what costs the most is the most important thing. So, after a while, we yearn for essential simplicity. And we come here. So what happens next in this short koan, before all the comments? Right? Crash. A 
student who was practicing under him accidentally broke the tray. What about you? Have you broken anything recently? You know, here at DBZ, many times people are in a rush. A tea bowl drops. An incense burner falls and breaks. A chair leg gouges a tatami. Be careful, you who are sitting on chairs, that all those chair legs are supported by a zabuton. And it's a terrible feeling isn't it? When you know you've broken something and you feel remorse, the whole self-recrimination pattern begins. Of course, it's important to feel regret deeply when we've been careless or insensitive, when we've hurt someone unintentionally. But then, with repentance, with true confession, okay, purification, okay, just as Qigong Roshi led us yesterday. We take responsibility. And then, with sincerity, we just care for the next thing with renewed attention. There is no need to turn the knife in the wound, okay? That just becomes a new way for the ego to ter- take over. I'm no good. I don't deserve to be here. No one can know how fundamentally broken I am. Everything I do is wrong. I'll never measure up. Remember, self-deprecation It's just another ego opportunity. Absorption in negativity isn't helpful to anyone. So you made a mistake? There have been endless mistakes since session began, right? Some you're aware of, some you're not. So when you become aware, are you truly sorry or just embarrassed? Oh, I hope they didn't see, or I hope they didn't know it was me. Trying to cover up takes a lot of energy. So, Say, I'm sorry, and then just go sweep up the broken shards, cook the meal, eat, wash up, go into the zendo and sit. And you might discover that it's not all about you. Maybe it's really not in a kind of uncanny way. Maybe you've experienced this. It's as if you are just the messenger. Things themselves take action. 
something leaps out of your hands. Things themselves. There are sermons given by insentient creatures. As the national teacher Nanyo Echu said, can you hear them? Hokuto gave a lovely rendition of Kyogen's sweeping at Chu Kokushi's shrine. Kyogen heard that insentient creature striking a stalk of bamboo. Another great teacher, Tozan Ryokai, came to a great enlightenment, digging into this koan of sermons by insentient things. Some of you heard Ruth Ozeki and I talking. We had our conversation last month about her newest novel, the book of form and emptiness. And both of us spoke of how important this koan was for us both. In her book, things have agency. They're teaching what the characters most urgently need to realize. And these things, they're all around you, aren't they? What are you sitting on? What is it that blocks us from hearing these teachings? That causes us to take things, and people too, for that matter, for granted. Here we remember Fugai's first comment. Maybe that monk didn't know how to move. Yes, perhaps he was attached to his solitary ways, sitting in emptiness, unable to step forth and give himself away. This is... Zen sickness, shutting out the suffering world, thinking one's own tranquility is the end point. Don't interrupt my bliss. (laughs) Breaking that ceramic tray seemingly due to the student's carelessness maybe but maybe it flew it flew out of his hands to give a teaching Nothing happens by accident, we say in Buddhism. So, what was the teaching? What is our vow? 
Are we living it passionately, as Qigong Roshi said, or is what we are doing just by rote? Now we do this, now we do that. This is the way it should be done. That form has to be followed. Are we giving our lives to whatever needs our attention without holding back, whether sweeping or leading a yoga class or doing lunch cleanup or giving a talk? And then Fugai says, the real treasure appears through the breaking. Here is the Trey's sermon. Wake up! What is your precious life for? What is the treasure of your life that you haven't been able to see because it's so ordinary. You're so accustomed to it. Then something happens and everything is turned upside down or, in actuality, right side up. Shattering our upside down views. And what lies far beyond upside down views, as the Heart Sutra reminds us? Hmm? At last. Yes, yes. So this is what the coronavirus is offering. Total disruption. At the end of the first year, you're like, okay, we'll get through this. It'll be over soon. At the end of the second year, what were we saying? Okay, with vaccinations, we'll get back to normal. Normal for whom? That was a privileged thought, wasn't it? And now here in our third year, this tricky virus has all manner of surprises. And Ba 2 will be followed by Ba 3, Ba 4, and Variants unknown. Variants, that's the point. Variants, always changing, shaking us out of our assumptions, our complacency. We really don't know what's next. We never have, but now it's abundantly obvious. And as if that's not enough, there's Putin's war to gobble up Ukraine. What's left of it? So many deaths. 
some four million refugees and fellow dictators in this country and in Europe and China are urging him on. We chant Kanzeo. We give ourselves passionately to our practice with faith in mind. We can't understand. <clears throat> With the rational mind, we just can't understand what an effect Our own intensive thought, our nen, our fervent prayers. What this can do. We hear all cries and we become Avalokiteshvara transmitting compassion through our thousand arms and hands and our thousand eyes. And pervades the whole universe. And then what? We recite Bodhisattva's vow, the koan of koans. What are we saying? Huh? When I, a student of Dharma, look at the real form of the universe, all is the never-failing manifestation of the mysterious truth of Tathagata. All. How can this be? When hunger, war, sickness, homelessness are all around us. This cannot be grasped by the intellect. The intellect automatically says, no way, and comes up with all sorts of egregious wrongs. But we just continue. Who can be ungrateful or not respectful? even to insentient things. Not to speak of human beings. If by chance they should turn against us and abuse and persecute us, we should bow down with humble words. Again, the re retaliatory mind says no. But we go further. You know, we like to say, oh, interconnectedness. We're all one. But really, take a look. Take a look. What is happening in the world? Do you think it has nothing to do with you? Are you completely without blemishes? 
Is your karma so pure? You know, once you may know this story, Mother Teresa was asked, how is it you do what you do working with lepers? And she said, because of the Hitler in me. Yes, we are all interconnected. We have all been there, there, there. And we are here. In the reverent belief that they are the merciful avatars of Buddha who uses devices to emancipate us from harmful karma that has been produced and accumulated upon ourselves through our own egoistic delusion and attachment throughout the countless cycles of kalpa. Wow. This vow. Hmm? You say it every day. But to really take it to heart and to know what it really represents. And then in each moment's flash of our thought, there will grow a lotus flower, and each lotus flower will reveal a Buddha. Well, that's what we're doing. Those of us who are involved in protests against the Vietnam War may remember putting a flower in the barrel of a gun. That's how close you could actually do that. Who remembers? Mm. And what did we call it? Hmm? Flower, power. Flower power. Yes, there will grow a lotus flower, and each lotus flower will reveal a Buddha. This is truth, okay? It's not just some pretty language, it's truth. So can we drop our righteous views and acknowledge our own harmful karma, even one moment of it, and receive these devices gladly. How about breaking through? What could be more important? That's what we're here to do, to shatter all our received notions, assumptions, all the ways in which we try to glue the fragments of our ego entities back together and cover over the cracks and blind ourselves to our complicity to injustice and suffering everywhere. Most of us probably know Jikon Leonard Cohen's anthem, 
And since he was such a dear friend of Chigan Roshi and was his mm -hmm, hmm, best man at his wedding, maybe he can sing. We can all sing it together, but he can lead us. Anthem. The birds, they sang at the break of day. Start again, I heard them say. Don't dwell on what has passed away or what is yet to be. Ah, the wars, they will be fought again. The holy dove, she will be caught again, bought and sold and bought again. The dove is never free. So, together. Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. The tray cracks, breaks apart. Sure, everything is impermanent, but what is most important? Forget your perfect form. What are you clinging to? Become this renewal of spring. Feel how the light is revealed. Well, Fugai asks, when Every day, this monk asks his student to replace the broken tray. Fugai asks, why would you want another? How can there be another? This is it. But perhaps the student needed to find this out for himself. Perhaps he was still engulfed by self-recrimination. So he searched everywhere. Every day he would bring his teacher a new tray. And every day the teacher would say, this is not it. Give me back my original one. What is this original one that the teacher is demanding? Fugai says if he were the student, he would just open his hands and laugh. We tend to think there's a do-over. We tend to think that we can patch things together. But there really is no taking away or breaking this original one. One act, one time. Ichigo Ichie. Unprecedented. Unrepeatable. Encounter. This is what we are doing in session. Encountering this unrepeatable, unprecedented moment of relationship. 
And Yogan Senzaki really appreciated the teacher's statement. This is not it. Give me back my original one. Now that the tray is in smithereens, bring the real thing, the original one, no imitations. Take away everything the student brings. Take away. No. How are you going to do that? Genro says, in place of the student, wait until the sun rises in the west. When will that happen? Here's the original one, in other words. In the midst of all the brokenness, of your life, all the things that have gone wrong, all the ways in which you have been crushed by sorrow, all the ways in which you have seen yourself lacking not good enough. All your dashed hopes and unmet expectations. Rise up. Rise up in the west. Rise up in the east. In the north and south. Rise up. Show the wholeness of your life, not the way you think it should be. But in this unthinkable, ungraspable sun rising in the west, mountain walking on the water, Fugai says he'll search for it in the place where he has not yet been born. We heard about this place from Hokuto Sensei on day two. The koan, show me your face from before you were born from your mother's womb. Or as it sometimes said, before your parents were born, what is your original face? Obviously, it's not where the student has been looking. Genro says, it's broken. That it you're searching for is broken, gone. It will be gone with the other, as Daisui said in Blue Cliff Case 29. When the cup of fire flares up and the great cosmos is destroyed, yes, it will be gone with the other. And as I was working with this koan, another koan came to mind, which some of you may know from the Blue Cliff Record, Case 91, the koan of the rhinoceros fan. I won't tell you the whole koan, but just the beginning. One day, Enkon called to his attendant, bring me my rhinoceros fan. This is a fan with a picture of 
a rhinoceros looking at the full moon. And of course, the rhinoceros is a type of ox. So this is a picture of original mind. Bring me my rhinoceros fan. And the attendant said, sorry, the fan is broken. The tray is in fragments. Nothing remains, nothing to attach to. So Enkan said, if the fan is broken, bring me the rhinoceros. Bring me the original one. So many times we find koans talking to each other. It's such a rich practice. So you can find that koan and see the numbers of people who are in it and what they say about this rhinoceros fan. But returning to the end of this koan, Fugai says to Genro, you may say it's broken, but the whole tray remains. Before birth, after death, this original mind has no beginning, no end. In one piece or in a million fragments, it's perfect. Each fragment is the whole. In the midst of your brokenness, you're perfect. And Genro then says, run after it. Find out for yourself. And Fugai says, the sword disappears in the water. A useless mirage. All our antagonisms, all our conceits, all the weapons of our daily warfare within lose their edge, lose their power in the ocean of session. Lao Tzu said, water is fluid, soft, yielding. But water will wear away rock, which is rigid and hard. And Hakarin said, without water, no ice can exist. So on this fourth day of session, the ice is melting. There's no one and nothing apart from this water in which we all are floating, sailing in this prajna boat on the great sea of realization. And there are a few more statements by everybody in this koan, but I think we can safely say that's it. <laughs>